Good morning, everybody. I guess that you can hear me. It's half past, and uh, I'm a Finn, so let's start this punctually. So, my name is Janne Kalliola, and I'm here to talk about the, how ICT greenhouse gas emissions are exploding in the ICT sector and what the Drupal community should do about it. I'll talk briefly about myself and a book that I wrote. Then I'll talk why the green coding is important, how energy is consumed in modern software, how to measure, how to reduce waste and how to minimize software, and then how to approach these in technical matters, from practical solutions, some Drupal specific matters, and then final words, and then you ask anything and I'll answer anything. So, as said, I'm, my name is Janne Kalliola. I'm the chief growth officer and founder of Exove. Uh, I have been coding from 83 onwards when I got my week 20 with a number of different languages. Uh, I've used open source from the 90s onwards with first with Java, Java World, and then later, later with the content management systems and the others. I'm focusing on growth of Exove. I think that we are an excellent company and I want to, our influence to be as big as possible. And uh, then I've been working with green coding and carbon neutral for, for a few years. I'm the chairman of Code from Finland Association that has uh, created the world's first uh, carbon neutrality label for software companies. So if you happen to be a Finnish company, then you might be able to get the get that label, and if there would be anybody interested to hear about more that label, to export it to other countries, then I'm, I'm more than happy to be at your service. My company is a design and software development company in Finland, Estonia. We have around 100 people, and we fight against digital frustration. That is the, what we do, that a lot of the digital systems are extremely hard to use, believe me or not, and we try to make them simpler. Then the book. So uh, I have written a book around 130 pages, available in Finnish and English, free of charge. Or you need to give your email address. We might send your email about the feedback and so forth. And if you want to have a crash course in Finnish, then the then the left most book is your choice. And then for those that are language restricted in this matter, then the English version on the right side is good. And then I made a second edition of the book a month ago or so. Uh, there's now AI, cryptos, IoT data and some other things like testing covered more. So the, uh, and that's, that's available there too. And those that were born in the, in the 70, 60s, 70s or 80s and used uh, ASCII text versions, there's also ASCII version of it with ASCII graphics that I, wore, I had a tremendous pleasure drawing them. If you don't know what I'm talking, then, then uh, that, that is actually your problem more than mine, but the, uh, it's, it, was, it was truly, truly good, truly good exercise and brought me back, to, back to, the, to the roots. And it's one tenth of the size of the PDF, so if you want to save on the, on the transmission cost, save energy, then you should choose the text version. But enough of me and the book, so let's get to the point. So why is this important? Why I'm here, hopefully why you are here. So the Finland's uh, Ministry of Transport and Communications made the world's first climate and environmental strategy for the ITC sector a few years ago. And in that, in that strategy, there was, uh, of course, a lot of research and studies made and they found out from different sources that the ICT sector as a whole consumes everything from 4 to 10 percent of world's energy. And then the Lancaster University made a study, this is from 22 if I'm not mistaken, so it pre pretty uh, current numbers that the greenhouse emissions that we cause are something between two to four percent. And these numbers are growing and they are growing extremely rapidly. So if we take the average of the emissions that is the let's say three percent and then we take the global emissions from the UN CAP report from 2022 that is uh, 58 gigatons. Gigaton is a uh, 
nine zeros and then tonso if you would put that in kilograms then it has 12 zeros so it's a very big number and then our share of that is 1.6 billion US billion uh, tons every single year for the sake of perspective this annual amount is almost the same as the weight of people and land mammals so and this happens every single year and this is growing so we need actually we need to do something about it so let's talk that where the energy goes because it, it, it just doesn't doesn't go to thin air or it, it sort of goes to thin air because it's about the electricity electricity that becomes heat but almost all software in the world Drupal included follows the same simple model that there are end-user devices that the end users are using to access the service there is mobile phones there is laptops there might be game consoles there might be fridges that are ac actually blackmailing the toaster because they have some pictures of it this is the iot world guys uh, and wants to have the payment in bitcoins then there's the network that connects the end user devices to the back end there are two kinds of networks there's wired and wireless networks and then the last mile connection the from the or the first mile if you th start from the end user perspective but anyhow that connection that connects the end user device to the trunk network is the cause of most of the emissions and then there's the cloud or data center where the all the stuff the magic happens and then let's go through all of these in in some, some detail i don't go too too big too detail here because i could talk this about for a few hours and we don't have time for that so the devices that are used there might be two kinds of device or oh, there, there are two kinds of devices there's the battery powered devices that i'm using here right now and then there are devices like the projector that is not a battery powered if the system is battery powered then it's typically optimized because nobody wants to have a huge battery back with them or enjoy one hour of usage time but then if it's a wall powered a plugged in the wall then most people don't really care that how much electricity is consumed because electricity is cheap and it, the one single device does not typically consume that much let's have a short poll that how many of you know that how much your television consumes energy when you're watching it nobody how many of you know that how much it consumes energy when it's sleeping so we have three hands because this is where how they sell it my television consumes i think that this was less than one watt and it's excellent but i have no clue that how much this consumes when my kids look at, uh, watch youtube on it the energy consumption in the end user devices should be split between the various applications running on the device so if you want to understand that how much your software uses energy it's pretty darn hard un unfortunately then the network network is the easiest part to measure because you can measure the data flows quite reliably and then the different connection methods have surprisingly good data about the energy efficiency typically measured as energy usage per gigabyte transferred when thinking of this you need to understand that the uh, client device might connect to number of backends so they might use different networks the backends might be in different continents and then we have the back end that is composed of all the systems that are needed to provide the service there might be a web server that is running drupal there might be a database server that is running mysql or mariadb there is some storage there's firewalls that vpn endpoint the log system back and backup system restore system that might or might not be tested there's the internal connectivity 
there is a lot of other things. And if you're working with any multinational corporation, there's probably virus scanners and all these kinds of things that they require in their requirements. And then you need to understand that how the energy is consumed by the systems that are dedicated to you and the systems that you share with others. And probably in cloud environment, you have no clue of those. So the energy consumed in the end user device, it's the device that consumes the energy, not the software. Of course, the software causes the consumption because you would not use the device without the software. This could be, a, for example, a mobile phone could be an excellent paperweight if, if it would be not, not used. As said, very optimized hardware when battery powered and not so when, the, when plugged the wall. The biggest hog is the screen. So if your software can be used without the end user devices, very good. If it can be used with, without the screen on, on the end user devices, not, not so good, but better. And if it requires you to watch the screen all the time, like watching the latest uh, development in the hidden world with the videos, then the, uh, most probably you are hogging a lot of energy. Of course, using GPS and these other sensors might also cause some or if the, your end user device is calculating bitcoins for you. That has happened too. So the networks, it's the, as said, the energy used per gigabyte, and there was 10,000 time difference between networks. 4G is the worst one, optical fiber is the best one. So if you have your home connection in 4G, and there's optical fiber available on your street, then switch. If you need to bring an excavator on the site, then don't switch because that doesn't probably help. And most probably the operators don't allow you to make the ditch wire show well, even if that would be a good exercise. And then the electric consumption of the server storage, internal network and everything else. This is optimized hardware as we, as we, uh, that should be run on full throttle that was discussed on, on Tuesday on, on platform SH and Nestle's excellent, excellent session about, the, about saving energy. So, in a, in a nutshell, I hope that everybody here knows that the software actually needs hardware to run. It still needs, it, it, has, it has not changed. If you think cloud, then the cloud is just a fancy name for somebody else's computer somewhere else it still causes emissions. Hardware causes emission during its life cycle. End user device, typically 80 to 90% of the emissions have been already sort of spewed into air when you got the device. So if you can extend the time lifespan of your device, then you will change, uh, save a lot of emissions. With the server side, it goes other way around that the, then the 20% of the server emissions are caused by the manufacturing logistics and the 80% with the usage. Hardware needs electricity and the emissions depend on type of energy. There is no clean energy per se because the windmills doesn't sprout up, sprout from the ground and, no, and the, the Electric, the, the solar panels just, just don't grow from to the, to the roofs, but somebody needs to install and need to be manufactured and so forth. So there's always some coefficient. But if you burn gas, oil or coal or, or oil shale, tar sand, then the emissions are way greater. So whatever you do, it's very, very paramount that you save energy because there's always emissions. So let's talk that how to do it. it it's fancy lofty goal that yes, everybody let's save, save energy and off we go. That most probably won't help that much. So we can save electricity by measuring and then making changes and measuring again. This has a problem that this is extremely hard. There is no good way no straightforward way to measure anything because it's very hard to draw lines that how much your software is consuming energy. Let's take a laptop. You might get the energy consumption of the browser for downloading and rendering your page, but how much of the energy consumed by the window manager 
is cause the browser rendering something on the screen? Nobody knows. I do care, but the, unfortunately, I'm not in a position that I could find it out. And same with every single thing. So, if you can measure, do it. But be warned that this won't be easy, and most probably, most of you will fail to measure. Then if you can measure, then share the results if you are allowed. Because there's lack of results, and the, or most of the results are watered down or greenwashed. Because the, this is the, the, the truth is so ugly that people don't want to face it. On the other hand, there was a study made by University of Beira Interior in Portugal that found that there is a strong or very strong correlation between the execution time and the energy consumption in all languages that they checked out. The study has its own flaws and it has been disputed for some, some for certain areas, but it still stands that the less seconds your system uses, the less energy it uses. Very, very simple. So everybody has a stopwatch somewhere that you can see that how, how long it does it take. Of course, if with, the, with the modern computers, you need to be pretty quick, so maybe you need to create a test set that it downloads the page like a thousand times or whatnot. This correlation might sound that, yes, of course, this is layman stuff, but now there's two things. First, that it's scientifically proven that this is actually the case, because all layman things are not actually true. And the other one was that there were no correlation, for example, between the usage of memory and usage of energy. The other way that if you can't measure is to reduce waste. I borrowed this concept of waste to the green coding from uh, lean manufacturing. I guess that somebody knows lean stuff here. But it's commonly defined as any action that does not add any value to the client. Of course, that what is the value to the client depends on, on, the, on the client and depends on the situation. But in the energy field, IT, IT field, you could use the same metaphor that the any action in the software that consumes energy but doesn't bring value to the client is waste and should be removed. I've recognized different kinds of wastes. There's a, a chapter in the book, 20 pages or so, that, so I don't go through all of these. But there's, for example, redundant software, that the software is not needed and it's still running. There might be a probe that is checking the existence of some other software that has been stopped down for many years ago and it alerts every minute that there's something wrong and nobody sees the alerts and it still consumes energy. So get rid of those. User errors is other favorite. That the users are very, very stubborn creatures. That if they fail, they try again. They fail, they try again and so, and so forth, so forth. And every single failure is waste because nobody got any value. My advice, never ask anything from the user. That's the easiest. If you have to ask, remember that computers are excellent in memorizing things, remembering things, and people are excellent at connecting things. So provide them as much information that you have in palatable format and let them make the connection and provide the input. Then there's a wrong architecture, wrong data model, too much data, unoptimized data, that are a bit two different things. Uh, transferring data for the sake of certainty that you are doing synchronization and then you see that, okay, I'm not sure whether what's going on, so let's scrap everything and start from scratch and then transfer everything. The typical developer answer is the algorithmic inefficiency. It's, these are somewhat in order of priority. Uh, it's down there because if you select your software wisely, then you actually actually don't end up in these that much. Deceiving user, one of my favorites, that it, it might be sometimes very hard to like cancel a contract and you you find it first, you do a lot of user errors, then you then you then you Google stuff, then you read something, then you watch a couple of YouTube videos how to how to get rid of this this uh, streaming service or whatnot, and then finally do it. And a lot has been wasted. 
wrong programming language, I have bad news, PHP is extremely inefficient language. So if you could do something else than do TypeScript, it is not that good either. If this would be mostly energy related, we would be coding in C and Rust. I have been coding C a lot. I don't recommend that to anybody. <laughs> but uh, I have not yet tried Rust, and there are, there are young people that like tr Rust, so there might be something, because no, no young people like C. <laughs> don't use Assembler, because nowadays the compilers are better writing Assembler than you are, because they take the multi-pipeline uh, uh, multi uh, processor better in the... In the uh, in the, uh, sorry, they take the multi, multi, multi pipeline processors better compared to humans because they can do the uh, optimizations, the parallelism, and everything else. Uh, then, waste in initialization. This is a PHP related problem that you initialize everything and then you run the software once and then it does only like fraction of the initialization is actually needed. So if you could make the initialization stepwise process that is good, but it's harder in an architectural manner. And then extra stuff that there's videos, there's a CEO saying hello to everybody coming to the coming to the website and nobody really cares because they're looking for the contact details or the address of the office that are typically hidden at the bottom of the page where you need to scroll and download all the images and videos on the way. Third angle is minimization, and this is not that easy to do with Drupal, unfortunately, because Drupal is not a minimal software. So if you have a task, a challenge, and then you, then you make a system that actually solves the challenge extremely elegantly, and only that and nothing else, then you could call that the minimal solution for it. Like the it's like uh, me going to shopping sometimes. I go to shop five funds and I'm looking for this one. Okay, I'll take it, go to the register and then cash out and I'm off. Extremely efficient. I'm happy, the shop is happy, we didn't waste anything. But the problem is that this might be against the KPIs, for example, marketing, that they say that our people, the people should be visit our website at least for five minutes. Why? If they got the transaction done, then throw them out, get next people in, like in restaurant business. But this is more a design problem than a development problem. So it needs the help for the designers. Those two others are more for de developer, developer matters. So, less execution time is spent, the less energy is consumed, the less data is transferred, the less energy the network uses, the less hardware is used, the less emissions are caused. Very, very simple in principle. In practice, it varies. But if you start to think about these things, that what is extra, what, what is something that I could get rid of that, or we don't actually need that script, or this, this library could go, you are always shrinking the software, which is, at the end, more energy efficient. Unless you write everything by yourself and add a lot of bugs, and then some of those bugs are performance bugs. I don't recommend that to anybody. So, how to approach the problem. You need to think about the impact. Impact above all. So the more popular your software is, is it the Drupal module? Is it uh, some other system? The more impact your changes have. And the more popular your software is, the more responsibility you have to the planet, to the climate. So if you are a software owner, Initiate this now, get people to help you. And if you are a contributor, then look for the energy hawks and fix them. Don't waste your efforts in small scale projects. If your module that is the fanciest and nicest and so forth, but it's used only you and your mother, then optimizing it is complete waste and you should go somewhere else to optimize something else because there's a bigger impact. There are a couple of good examples of the impact. For example, when the uh, when WhatsApp was sold uh, to Facebook, they had one billion end users with a team of eight people developing the software. 
So they actually know the shit. They, they actually know how to make, make the software. And it has to be very efficient and error-free that you can actually serve that amount of people because you can I imagine the amount of problems one billion people would start to send them if the system would not work. Or the SQLite, everybody of you is carrying at least one instance of SQLite. SQLite has one trillion installations. So think of that, that if somebody is saying, okay, this slows it one millisecond and consumes energy, then if we put one trillion milliseconds in a row, then it's still pretty big amount of seconds that energy is consumed. Maybe for nothing, maybe for something good. Who knows? That is the question. But when you make those changes, you need to think about these things. If you don't, you are not carrying your weight, you are not doing the impact. So, practical solution, how to actually do it? So, in Drupal and in, in web in general, using proper formats is good. So, changing the images to WebP changes 10 to 15 percent without any visual degradation of the quality of the images. Of course, it renders certain uh, browsers obsolete that they can't use the service maybe. Cache everything if, when you can. When you have a good cache strategy and you actually know how, the, how it works, if you don't understand anything about caching, then let somebody else do it for you because the caching is the easiest way to consume a lot of energy. <laughs> Compress everything that's possible. Compress them in a build phase. Compress them once and decompress them many, multiple times. Minimize possibility for errors. Reduce amount of videos. Replace them with animations that pack better or static images. Reduce data transfer that if, you, if your system calls home every five seconds, maybe it could do it every minute and then you have saved uh, 11, 11 of 12 requests every minute. Strip unneeded typefaces. There might be fonts that have like 12 typefaces and you are using two. Be a bit cautious with glyphs that if you reduce the amount of glyphs and then your client is bought by, let's say, a Turkish company that has the I without the dot, that is called Tittle, by the way, uh, then you might be screwed because it's, you strip that glyph that nobody actually uses anywhere. Reduce amount of code, remove dead code, remove everything that you comment out because you have, a, hopefully, you have a version control. If you don't, then start using it. Be mindful when adding new libraries. There was a study made by Lappert and the University of Technology that around 5% of the surface area of a library is used and that stacks when you have a library that is using a library that is using a library that is using a library and so forth. But don't write everything by yourself. You are bound to make mistakes. And as Linus said, many eyes make bug shallow. So the ready-made libraries are way better tested than your code. And most probably they are way better coded than your code too. Limit the amount of code that is sent over the network. Try to get it shared if possible that it would be already there. But then, of course, the, because of the attacks and the others, the browsers limit that how much you can have impact there. Improve code efficiency. There's always one hotspot or one bottleneck in the software that you should fix. When you fix that, then the bottlenecks go somewhere else. There's never a software that has no bottlenecks. There's always one bottleneck. If you can't fix the biggest one, then of course you said, okay, this is, this is like law of the nature, we can't do anything about it anymore. Then move forward, you gains will be smaller, but they will be still gains. When the amount of data is large, big, then you need to use the right algorithm for the task. And if you were born in 60s or 70s, then the algorithm that you used when you were a young coder might not be the best anymore because they don't take the parallelism into account. So the newer ones might be better. Consider implementing part of the software in different language. This is how they do in Python, that the Python, what is also very inefficient language, 
and they are using it with uh, data manipulation and data, data, all kind of data stuff and AI stuff. But they do it so that they have C bindings and they try to do most of this stuff within C libraries that are just controlled by the Python. So the data comes in in C code, it's manipulated in C code, it's written in C code, and the Python just controls that what C code is executed. And it, that makes way more sense. Don't ever write data manipulation in PHP. There is way better languages for that. Some Drupal specific matters. So, in general, Drupal is popular enough that its impact to the energy consumption is notable. System is not that efficient, and the quality of modules and themes have wild variation. There's excellent code and there's not so excellent code. Both the core and the ecosystem should step up and focus on saving energy. The sustainability efforts that we have on the, on the Drupal.org are not focused on the platform. There's now a team being formed. Mike Gifford here in the audience is, is, is helping in that. And if you are interested in this, then join the Team Sustainability channel in Drupal.org Slack. Hosting Drupal sites in Carbon Offset Data Center moves the problem somewhere else because there's the principle of the last power plant. Of course, the electricity network is not complete, so it might be that it's, it actually makes a lot of sense to move the, move the data manipulation and the, and the hosting to an area where the electricity is cheaper, or not sorry, cheaper, but of course that makes sense too, but it's, it's cleaner than host it somewhere where it's not that clean. And there's huge differences between countries. Finland, when I checked, when I wrote the book, the six months average was around 30, 34 grams of uh, CO2 per kilowatt hour. Germany was 385, if I'm not mistaken, for 2022, so there's 11 fold difference. Bosnia was more than one kilogram because they use more coal and so forth. So the, uh, take these into account, but it's not just enough that you said, okay, I'm, I'm moving it somewhere else and then it's, I'm done. <coughs> but you need to also reduce the energy consumption of the system. The global energy usage is growing faster than the production of renewable energy. So this is something that we need to act. So the question is that the, maybe there's a module that would solve all the problems that we'll install and then, then fire and forget <coughs> goodbye. That won't work. You can't solve complex problems with simple solutions. And adding yet another module. Mike made some changes, but in practice it always adds the complexity of the system and causes more energy to be consumed because it needs to be initialized, it needs to be, it needs to be configured and so forth. It's a systemic matter that you need to take into account in every single level you are working on the software. There is no escaping that we are doing pretty bad job in the software industry because the past 20 years we have been focusing on things that make the software developer faster and not the software more efficient, and we need to turn that tide. Of course, reducing amount of transfer data, doing proper caching, and these help. And there, there might be modules that are beneficial for certain sites somewhere, but there's no probably no module that would solve it all, and modules will help you to move forward, but they don't solve the problem completely. Once again, impact versus pop impact and popularity. So if you are doing site development, then the amount of visitors that how many times the site is loaded define the popularity. And then if you have a small site with small number of users and you have a big site with big number of users, of course you should optimize the big one first and then maybe use the same code to optimize the small one. Sometimes it might be easier to start with the small one and then use, the, use it on the big one. But anyhow, think about the impact. You need to select the modules and themes carefully. 
you should read the code sometimes. I've done that, for example, with WordPress, and uh, and the, they say code is poetry, and uh, either it's it's so modern poetry that I didn't understand, or then it was very very badly coded. The jury is still out there. Measure the site frequently, and keep the records. This is crucial. And then compare that. You know that if I make some changes, that did I actually improve or or make the make situation worse? And then if you are in a module and theme development business or core business, core development business, the amount of installations and the usage pattern define the popularity. And then you should focus on the biggest impact. When something is truly, truly popular that is installed almost every single Drupal installation, it's used heavily there. Then you need to measure and reduce the energy use as possible. And I guarantee you that if you take any module, there's always places to improve. But the problem is that writing energy efficient code is not straightforward with modern systems. And uh, you are not able to think from that perspective that easy because you have not been thinking for a long time about the energy. I guess that the, after 90s the, the, the computers have been always fast enough. If you build something then focus on the core matters of the module or theme. Don't stuff everything and kitchen sink there. This is especially bad in WordPress, where the, there's a commercial aspect that the, that the modules have all kind of features. That there's feature lists are like one <coughs> kilometer long, and most of them are completely useless for those people that actually understand what the module does or the plugin does in that world. Drupal is better in that sense because the modules are developed for the by the developers for the developers. And then limit amount of updates. This doesn't mean that there's a security up, that there's a security hole in your module that okay I'll, I'll sit on that for six months to save energy. That is not a good way. But if there are features, then maybe put them together and not release a module version every single month because that will be automatically updated in the future. And it, the update costs eats energy and. Uh, it might be completely needless for the performance of the site where the module is used. Final words. This is a journey, so do not expect that all changes can be done at once. We need to keep the client, internal or in agency case, most, most cases external one, happily, because if you have happy clients, they are happy to make changes. If you come to the happy client and say that, dear Mrs. Client, we would like to make these kind of energy saving uh, changes and it would cost you this much of money. They said, ah, oh, interesting, let's talk about it. But if you have an unhappy client and you go to the Mr. Client, we would like to make these changes and they said, yes, uh, uh, fancy and stuff, but I have this big list of bugs that you should fix first and then we might discuss about that and now off you go. Satisfied clients allow us to make more changes to the systems. But don't set too ambitious goals in any of these, because if you try to eat the elephant once, then most probably you will choke and you will be replaced by somebody else that doesn't care that much about energy consumption and the world is worst place because you are uh, recovering from burnout and then some, some idiot is replacing you. So keep good care of yourself. And remember that with all journeys, the most important thing in starting a journey is to take the first step. And I have really, really good news for you. By attending this session, you have already taken the first step. You are already on the journey. And now I ask you to continue walking for the best of the planet. Thank you. So thank you so much for, for the talk. I think it was uh, really amazing. Um, I have one question here. Um, it asks, how much does removing commented out code help prevent emissions, and what is the reason for it? Uh, the, it, it depends. Uh, every single answer from a senior software developer always starts, it depends. So it depends on the case, but uh, the commented code Commented code 
takes as much space as non-commented code. So if you have half of your code commented out, then half of your data transfer for that specific code is waste. It doesn't compress any better if it's inside the comments. If your code is not transferred, that it sits on the, like in, in Drupal, Drupal sits in the, in, the, in the server side and it's installed there once, it doesn't really matter that much. PHP and the others are pretty quick to optimize the files. They have the JIT compilers and the others that get rid of the code. It doesn't matter. And then with all mobile apps and the others, the stores cut extra code. They have a static analyzers that will then remove stuff that is not actually used by your software. But if you transfer code, HTML, CSS, JavaScript to the end user device, then it actually matters. And it matters with the percentage of how much you have commented code in the, in the uh, JavaScript file, CSS file, and so forth. The amount of energy depends of the selected network and its energy efficiency, because this is mostly network issue. Of course, the, it takes some time to pass the comments, but not that much. So the, you need to think from the, from the network perspective. There was a question in the back. Hi, uh, so, um, so I'm at OctoFin where we, uh, we're an agency basically spe specializing in the wildlife conservation and environment sector, so this is amazing to hear. And I love the fact that it's like, it's also making everyone's websites better because performance is just makes everything amazing. Uh, but I'd like to ask whether, so it is still a massive impact, like two, 3%, loads of emissions, but I think the main focus of the tech sector sh on environmental matters should probably be uh, which clients we work with, uh, whether we support um, environmental organizations and whether we help sort of overthrow governments that are just causing the main pain. I think it's great to focus on efficient code, but actually a lot of the people who say, oh look, we've got a green sustainability stamp, also work with really awful organizations and uh, we need to focus on that and say no to business sometimes. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, this, the, I don't agree with you. Let's, let's start with this one. So the, uh, because these are not either or. There was a discussion about it uh, when, we, when I started about talking about green code and a lot of coders said that it, it's really negli neg negligible that what they do, then it would be better than they would, instead of driving to work, they would bike to work. And so excellent, bike to work and then start writing green code because they don't really sort of shut each other out. So when you code, you should code green code all the time. But then, of course, donating to the course working with the proper clients. And then one thing that was not directly mentioned is the, the carbon footprint and carbon handprint. So the carbon handprint is the reduction of somebody else's footprint that we can do as IT. So we should maximize that while minimizing the carbon footprint of our software. Typically, in most cases, the our carbon footprint is is very, very small compared to the carbon handprint, what the software can do. That if you have, let's say, a, a steel mill and you can improve its in, uh, performance with 2%, then it doesn't really matter what kind of code you run. But if you, like me, watch Netflix instead of uh, aerial television, then it actually matters a lot because all the, all the energy consumption happens because we have selected to use an IT system that has replaced the less convenient way of watching television that everything is not available at the fingertips. And it's because then it's unicast against multicast and multi multicast would be way better, but it would be incon inconvenient. Yeah. But you are right. We need to approach this from every single possible angle, and we need to understand where the impact lies, because we can't have everything at once. But it doesn't mean that none of those should be, none of them should not be done, but they need to be done in certain order that maximizes the impact as a function of time. Any other questions? Uh, let's, let's wait for the microphone that we get in the video. 
do you have any thoughts on the, the web sustainability guidelines that the WC3 put out as a draft, uh, the community group put out as a, a draft um, in September? Uh, I haven't read them. I have had a busy, busy times, but the, uh, I think that the, uh, in, in general, those guidelines are good, but again, their effectiveness depends on your case. So you need to be senior enough to understand that what actually makes sense and what is, what is uh, more of uh, brings a good, good sort of wipes to everybody that we are following something that actually does not have impact. So the impact analysis should be done always and that kind of material the analysis that whether this makes sense to make the say that we can save now one kilowatt per year globally after working hard for two weeks. It doesn't make sense, you should use the two weeks somewhere else, but if you would say save a gigawatt, then the story might be different. Thanks, Jana, for the talk. Uh, getting back to your point about the largest impact, and also thinking about the larger picture, I'm just curious because this is my first DrupalCon. Has Drupal done a full carbon audit scope one, two, and three no. in order to know where to act to have the biggest impact if it's in the code or if it's somewhere else? Uh, no, no. What I know that the, nothing like that has been done. Yeah, there's other people's also also confirming that. Uh, so again, we are in a in a situation that there are no sort of good measurement data. So until that's done, then uh, optimizing your own code, the, the old style optimizes, optimizations that are valid from the, like the era of computing are still valid and they are good and they should be followed. Uh, but then the, where the impact lies, before the, we have that kind of, I, I need to talk with the board about that, but the, before we have any of that, then I would use the popularity as the next best thing as, as impact assessment. There was the question here. Yeah, my question is around, um, I mean, you wrote a book. Uh, it's available on the front page on, of your website. And my question is, how is the reaction of your clients to that? Is that important? Do you get new clients based on that? I'm wondering. And I'm smiling, not 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 <laughs> not, not friendly smile yet. But the, uh, 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 let's start with the with the ideological answer first. So we believe, we truly believe that the that going green is the is the right and the only choice because there's no business on the dead planet, as they say. And we think that as a company, we will get benefit out of it. We have not seen that much benefit yet. The funny thing is that uh, I have. I have a 17 year tenure at Exove now, and I have probably seen hundreds or thousands of RFQs, public and private. Three of them, three of them have mentioned this. One in sort of generic terms that we need to have, uh, we need to have uh, uh, environmental program and so forth. One specifically, that this needs to be coded in green, we want that case. And then one was an analysis of green code criteria written by, by Finnish, uh, Finnish uh, uh, IT society. And we want that with a big margin. So yes, we see that our, that our expertise is showing. The bad thing is that the, in total that was like probably 70 to 80K, so it, it still dropped in a bucket, unfortunately. But, I, but now, the Finnish, uh, Finnish uh, state-owned procurement company Hansel that is channel, ch uh, channeling everything, oh, most of the money from the government and the, and the universities and big cities and so forth, they made the new IT consultancy uh, 23 to 28 program that has its more than 1 billion euro program. There was one specific line about green coding that, this is, uh, that you can buy green coding through that program. I have net, not yet it's seen, but the program has been running for two or three months. But it's a good sign that somebody's actually putting money on it. Because at the end, what I forgot to mention here is that there's the golden rule. That who has the gold makes the rules. 
and that's why the clients are key people to make this change, because if they say that we will select somebody that actually knows about these things, then the world changes rapidly. If not, if it's a grassroots movement, then the world will change very slowly, unfortunately. So that is one way to also try to change the procurement criteria of your clients. Um, could it possibly be like the uh, changes in VCRK and stuff, like more uh, accessible websites that it was also like not thinked about first and then now more and more people are uh, going to companies that uh, also take this into account when coding and stuff? Hopefully, yes. I think that the, the European Union has one superpower and that's regulation. We have 500 million people that are pretty affluent in the world sense and every single regulation we create and everybody starts to follow worldwide because they want to sell to Europe. And CSRD regulation that requires everybody to disclose the uh, uh, scope one, two and three uh, emissions starts in force, I think, for the big companies early next year. We are now part of a bigger public listed company as, as our company, and we are preparing for that, that we can do that every, every month. And the auditor, the financial auditor, like Ernst and Youngs and these companies will actually audit the results. So I think that the, the, a lot of bigger companies will need to straighten their ties and do something about it. And then it gradually will roll down because they require the same calculation from their vendors, and they need to, from their vendors and so forth to the, where the, where the actual coder is there somewhere that, okay, that yes, I need to figure out that what, what I'm producing as emissions or what the system is producing as emissions. So yes, I think that the, uh, this kind of uh, regulative approach is way better because when I talk with people from states, they say that, yeah, this is fine and dandy, but uh, because there's no that much of a business, business, uh, pros and cons, there are more constant pros, then the, they might not do it because nobody forces them to do it. Customers, consumers are the other part, but unfortunately I was in a, in a, in a seminar uh, 18 months ago in Lapland, Finland, and there was one of the biggest grocery chains in Finland saying that, uh, was it like two of the six or seven consumer groups care about these things and others don't. So I would not have too many high hopes with the consumers. We think that the consumers are there, are there and they, everybody would like to do it, but we are probably inside a bubble with the other people that are like us, unfortunately. So that was around 80 to 25 percent of the consumers that care about these things. And then there were a couple of group of consumers that one was uh, affluent males that actually are against this whole thing because it sometimes somehow goes inside their skin or whatnot and feels that they, they are making wrong choices and that's why this is something that needs to be opposed by any cost. That they sleep while the beds are burning, unfortunately. <laughs> any other questions? There's one there. Um, it seems like uh, the solution uh, from the code side uh, is to be minimal uh, as much as possible but being minimal uh, means less functionalities so less budget and how how can you deal with this uh, in the context of uh, web agency uh, where you have to sell services to earn money? That is, uh, an excellent, uh, that is an excellent question, by the way. Uh, that means that I don't have should any you, it, so. Should you sell more website, more minimal website, but it, it's always more? Yeah. Uh, very, very excellent question. I still don't have any, any good answers. I, what I would do, if I would do the, and, and we try to do the minimal website, there's, there's so much legacy that you could work probably, at least I'm, I'm 50 around, so I could work with legacy probably until I'm in pension, hopefully, maybe. But, uh, and I think that the IT industry will sooner or later shift in a position that there's more legacy to be kept up than new code to be written. So you should prepare for that too. 
So that would be one, one angle that, okay, gradually make it better. There are new needs that are needed. Writing minimal software is not fast. Uh, writing energy efficient software is extremely slow and tedious process. I wrote, uh, I went the, when the electricity uh, price was high and I, we have two electric, electric cars at the family, I wrote a module for a magic mirror, that I have a magic mirror display that shows where my kids should be. At, at which given date when they have the sports uh, and uh, then I added a graph that shows the electric price. The electric price, if you don't know, it's once a day at, at uh, 3 o'clock Norwegian time. It's, it's from Norway, Norway, the whole thing. It's updated for the next 24 hours. In JavaScript, it's extremely hard to tell that, okay, one past four finish time, that is one hour one hour uh, ahead of Norwegian time, we should, the system should pull the new results. No, lo no earlier, no later, one minute past, and then update the graph. It's extremely hard to make that kind of, uh, because there's no that you can say that, okay, certain amount of seconds in the future. I could download a big, big, big library to calculate those things, MomentJS or something else, and there would be a lot of extra code that would be complete waste. So I wrote the algorithm myself, took half a day. And I'm not a bad coder, mind you. And then I need to make a system so that it fails, because it sometimes fails, it's not fail, fail safe, that it tries again every half an hour. And it stops trying when it got the data. And then it also, only once an hour, because then the changes the, the, that you need to update the bar chart. It doesn't update every minute, every five seconds, but once an hour. But you need to know when the hour has struck, that you update after it, not before but after. Again, hard to calculate in JavaScript. So I spent two days getting this right. So the minimal is hard and green software is hard. If you can convince the client, there will be work, but there will be way less end results. And that is the problem that I haven't cracked yet. Maybe next year, let's see. I'll try, I'll think about it. Okay, it seems that we are out of questions, so thank you everybody. Thank you.